and they about knocked me out. All right, boy, I tell you what, feels good to be depositing some checks from that cleaning business. I done dumped so much money into that thing. And since it's been closed down, it's been good to get some checks rolling in. But folks, that's not what today is about at all. Today, folks, we are getting ready to go meet an awesome fan of After Prison Show, a guy by the name of Jamal. Now, to give you a little bit of backstory on this dude, uh, this guy sent me an email about a week ago, and that's how we first began to, to talk. And when I heard this guy's story after that first email and beginning to speak with this guy on the phone, I was just super compelled by this dude. This is a guy who's 31 years old, who's lived in a hotel for over two years now. He served some time in jail, uh, and he's also handicapped. This guy's been in a wheelchair his entire life. He tells me as we begin to talk that After Prison Show is something that gives him encouragement and inspiration and mainly just some entertainment. He tells me he doesn't get a chance to get out and do much of anything at all. And you know, I try to think to myself, how would he if he was even able to? I can imagine getting around, you would have to deal with any kind of transportation that could accommodate someone who is handicapped and in a wheelchair. This guy also tells me that he deals with quite a bit of depression. And you know, when I hear that, and also hear that after prison show is something that gives him some type of entertainment and something to look forward to. It's hard for me to put into words what that means to me personally. I know that after prison show reaches a lot of people and I know it reaches a lot of people of all sorts of different backgrounds. But to hear so many individual stories that are so different from one to the next. Jamal's story is just another example of how powerful After Prison Show really is. And today I wanna go meet with this guy. This guy's local to where we are, and if we can do anything to try to help lift the spirits of this dude, I truly feel like that's something we should do. We're gonna get to know this guy today. You're gonna get to know him just as we're gonna get to know him because this is gonna be our first time meeting him, as it will yours as well. And I also, want to talk with this guy about what he's been through and more importantly ask this guy a question that's been asked to me quite a bit throughout the course of after prison show you know what is it like to serve time for a person who's in a wheelchair ain't a parking spot around ain't a parking spot i think that guy's getting ready to leave we're getting ready to go to the p.o box right now you could go park way over oh you can wait on him oh no he wants to get back in his trunk hey did i shut my trunk all the way yeah okay i didn't want to let him see that I was filming. Then he would really take forever to get out of here. We're going to the P.O. Box real quick as well. Uh, we got to pay the, the tab on the P.O. Box. And then we're going to go meet with Jamal. So we're going to see what we got. We haven't been here in what, like two weeks? Yeah, it's been two, three weeks. You know, when we came the last time, I asked them if I owed any money. And they said that my, my, my the box was current. You could have let me know that it was due in two weeks. But we'll see. Probably going to have a few things in here for... The whole crew. <gasps> nope, you're coming to the PO box or the post office too, and guess what? There ain't a parking spot. Oh, wait. It feels good to be out of the house. I haven't been out in like three days. I feel like I've been a hostage in my own house. I've been on house arrest. Cody, thank you for helping me escape. <laughs> it looks like there's some things in there. What's all the speed do? Yeah. Yeah, gotta pay that. Gotta make sure we stay paying that. Yeah, we got a couple of. Got one key. Maybe the key in there. I'm not sure. Is it to the big box? Sure, 62. Yeah, that's one of the big ones. Uh oh. Check another key in here. You said you saw another key? No, I was making sure there wasn't. Yeah. Uh -oh. Let's see what's in 62. Holy moly. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, please open on camera. Should I open it right now? Where is this? The perfect fit for your active lifestyle. Boy, this is Viagra. I mean, because that's what it looks like it might be. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. Feel secure in all that you do. Oh my God. Appreciate it.
I wonder what's in those packages. We have been on the road for a little while. We are almost at the location where Jamal is at. Again, Jamal's been living out of a hotel for over two years now. And you know, to think about living at a hotel, it's already gonna be small and claustrophobic and you're not gonna really have that much room in there. Granted, you are gonna have a room. At least you do have some kind of shelter, some kind of housing. But to also think about being limited in the fact that, you know, you can't walk, you, you're in a wheelchair. I can't imagine what this guy's life has been like or what this guy's life is like. And it's just a really crazy thing to know that this guy rocks with the after prison show and he finds some kind of entertainment and support from the videos that we create. So we're about to be here and we're gonna be meeting Jamal. Hey man, how you doing? Alright, man, you tall, bro. Yeah, that's what I was just saying when I was coming up here. I thought, What's up? I said YouTube, I could, uh, YouTube, how y'all doing? Okay. What's going on, Jamal, nice man? Nice to meet you guys. It's a pleasure to get a chance to meet you, man. Man, that's a blessing. I finally yeah. met somebody I watched. As well as you, Cody. <laughs> Cody, Dude, appreciate you having us over here, man. So, uh... You guys wanna come in? Yeah, man. Come in and see my humble abode. So this is it, man. You been in here for how long now? Like eight months. I've been doing the hotel thing off and on for about two years, two and a half years, with the help of my aunt. Cause you know, disability every month ain't nothing. I only get a certain amount of money a month, so I gotta count on her to pay the rest. And I've been looking into, you know, finding other places to stay, things of that nature, and it ain't been working out. But yeah. my aunt found somebody in the newspaper that got something for rent. He said when he get time, he'll call me and talk to me. Like a room for rent. Yeah, but he want 150 a week, but I don't want to depend on that. I want to actually pay it myself. Right. So I told him most I pay is about four or four fifty, but I want to still have some money in my pocket. So hopefully that work out. I can get out of this situation and not have to be a burden on my aunt because she's 72 years old. So that's crazy. She get tired. Well, at least you got that support, man. Yeah, a lot of people don't got that. You guys, YouTube, hello. A lot of guys don't got that, and women also. So you know, it's good that I got a family member helping me. You know. I look at it like that. Yeah, for sure. So this is how you do it right here, man. Yeah, I just sit in here all day and just be on my phone, YouTube, watching you guys, well as other videos, Instagram, Facebook. My video chat some young ladies every once in a while. Text message. But other than that, I just sit in here and look down. Nah, man. I mean, it's, you know, I was talking about it when we were coming over here. And right. I, was, I was thinking to myself, one, living in a hotel, you're not going to have a lot of room in here. Exactly. Correct. And with the fact that you are handicapping in the wheelchair, right. it's just got to make it even that much more almost probably claustrophobic. Yeah, I get like that. And I got to go out and get some fresh air once in a while and stroll around sometimes and, you know, just try to stay sane, I guess you would say. You know. I noticed one thing when we pulled up to this hotel and and maybe all hotels have this, but this one definitely looks like it has a lot more handicap accessibility than any other one that I've seen. Yeah, that's correct. In the front, all these rooms are handicap accessible. And then in the back, those are regular rooms. So is it also a struggle trying to find rooms that are like this, that do have the... the yeah, it is, because the other rooms I've been to in the past, it was, you know, rooms were you know, decent size as far as where the bedding was at, but the bathroom was small. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, how am I gonna get my wheelchair in there? I would have to get out the wheelchair and scoop. But being that I had bed sore surgery, you know, and that's closed, I ain't wanna keep doing that. So my aunt said, we gotta find something that's sufficient to where you ain't gotta do that, you just roll your wheelchair in. And I'm like, well, okay, cause I ain't gonna pay nobody if I can't get in the bathroom. But we did it a few times because that was the only option we had. Right. But then she was worried about me injuring myself and a couple times I failed. So she was like, you know, no, nah, we're gonna come here. And this is my second time being here and they pretty cool. They ain't tell me time's up, you gotta leave. You know, I guess it's cause they're getting the money, you know. Right. But other people they been kicked out and I'm like, well, these people work, you know, they can possibly kick me out, but 
I don't know what the situation was, but I'm blessed that they let me stay for eight months, you know. And yeah. we pay on time, so I never have to tell my aunt when the rent is due. She knows. Because her and my mama take turns putting the room in their name because I don't have an ID. And it's been a heck with that getting that done. So my mom comes pay the room, you know, and they already know. And when I got my money, I just get on my debit card like, look, that's all I got. That's enough for three weeks. That's all I get enough for. So they already know to take their money off and pay the rent. And I can't do nothing else to go to enjoy myself and do not just sit in here. Female friends don't want to come get me. Don't nobody want to do nothing. They just want to talk on the phone. I don't want to talk on the phone. But I try to stay sane. Meet people like you guys. You know that helps. So, look, I want to I want to talk to you about this too. Uh, you know, one thing that you had mentioned through the phone calls that we had was you deal with depression. Yeah. And I mean, what does that stem from? The fact that your situation does it stem from just it probably just stems from a lot of things but yeah you know what is it like just dealing with that what what keeps you motivated i guess is the best question to ask uh basically what keeps me motivated is just having family members you know i got nieces and nephews so if i was to do anything that was in the negative and out of the norm to physically harm myself i have to think that that's not the right decision to make and it comes from being handicapped paralyzation you know what i've been through in my life and just trying to, you know, understand why God put me in this situation. You see what I'm saying? A lot of people don't look at it in that aspect. They look at it like, okay, well, whatever, you know, and then just lash out on people. I just, you know, be depressed, be in my little corner. And I like to talk to people about depression. A lot of people don't want to talk about it. You know, they just want to, oh, leave me alone. And I want to talk about it, be open with people, let them know this is what's going on. And it's not a facade. I do got a cast on my leg, YouTube. Ligaments been torn for six years. So, you know, I'm really going through it. I got spinal bifida, I was born with that. So this is not no no act. I'm really in a wheelchair, really messed up, you know, but through the grace of God, I just stay sane. I'm on depression medicine and I take blood pressure medicine. So I make sure I take them, but I stopped taking the depression medicine and start messing with my sleep. So my doctor said, you know, we're gonna try to switch that, but still keep the medicine, which right. is weird. If you don't want me to take it while I'm keeping it, you know, give me something else. But that's all I basically do is just as long as I got a, cell phone, I try to stay sane and communicate with people. If I ain't had no electronics or nothing like that, I don't know what I would have did. A couple times I kind of contemplated doing some harm to myself. I'm like, nah, that ain't gonna work. You're a good guy, you got a lot going for yourself, so just try to stay sane. Look, I wanna, I was talking about this as we were filming coming here. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, you emailed me, I think it was a week ago when yeah. you first emailed me and we began to talk and, right. and talk about meeting up as well. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you said you rock with the after prison show and that it brings some kind of enjoyment or entertainment to you, oh, yeah. I mean, that means a lot to me. So with the fact that you were local to us, I definitely wanted to come and, and meet with you, get a chance to know you, introduce you to our audience, and you know, see what we could possibly do moving forward with you. Even if we could just come and kick it with you from time to time. Right. I mean, look, I can't imagine, I've lived in a hotel right. uh, before, but Never for the the amount of time that you have, right? And I, I just remember what it feels like to be stuck in a room, and just feel like, you know, this this is all you got for right now. Yeah, man, it's, it's definitely annoying. But like I said, you just try to make the best of it. You know, I sit in here, then I see people on Instagram, Facebook, they going out, going places. I'm like, well, I'm broke. I ain't got no money to do that. I mean, it's it be nice days, and I just sit in here like it's a nice day today. I want to go out, but I'm broke. Like, what I'm broke? A person like. Me ain't supposed to be sitting here like this every day. I don't care if it's just catching the bus and ride the bus and go get some ice cream or something or tell a female friend, hey, you catch the bus, come meet me somewhere. Other than sitting in here, because I'm going insane, you can't really see it, but from you talking to me, you can see it. I'm going crazy, cuckoo. Just opening the door, sitting at the door, that's boring. Yeah. I don't know. But you know, you two, they probably understand. You understand, Cody. Shouts out to Dave and Rabbit too. I want to meet them guys. I wish we could have brought them. Uh, Rabbit started a new job. Dave's been working a lot of his night. Shout out to you guys, man. Oh, yeah. You guys, man. And that's what he, that's that's what you had told me. You said, you know, I want to meet the whole crew. Right, right, exactly. But, and in due time, we will. We probably will. Jamal, again, greatly appreciate you having us over here and, and getting a chance to to meet you. And you know, it's also a really awesome thing that you rock with after prison show. Yes, sir. You know, tell me a little bit about what made you, like how you found the After Prison Show and, and what you liked about it. And I don't want this to sound like any kind of an ego trip right here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but, 
But what what made you stumble across it and what kept you checking it out? Uh, I was on uh, YouTube and I just happened to see it and I was like, you know, let me check these guys out. And I checked it out and I was like, well, this is something unique, you know. You guys have a story to tell because you guys did time as well as me doing a little bit of time. I ain't did near as much time as you guys, but I sat down and I was there. So, you know, I was like, you know, let me see what they talking about. And as I started watching more, I was like, I like, I like these guys. I would love to meet these guys in person. So one day I was like, okay, this is how I get in contact with them. Let me email. Then I kept going back, make sure I had the right email. I'm like, let me email this guy, tell him my story. Hopefully he would want to meet me and help me out. And maybe I can make a YouTube and people can hit my story. You see what I'm saying? And we were talking about that just a little while ago when we weren't filming. Right. Uh, you know, you do have aspirations of wanting to do videos. Right. And one thing that I was saying is, you know, meeting you for the first time, seeing your energy and your, your personality it's it's really an amazing thing. Thank you. I think to myself, because I get depressed as well, and you mentioned that you know you deal with depression. Right. Somebody's always got it worse. And even as cliche as that sounds, you know, what do I really got to be depressed about when right. and I hate to even say this, there's people like you who deal with disabilities and certain handicaps. Correct, correct. But there's also the things that you have to be grateful for. Right, as well. You've got somewhere to live. It might not be the most ideal situation right now, but it's been uh, it's been somewhere for you. Right. It's been a, a roof over your head, and you've been here for quite a long time. Right, correct. You know, you had mentioned that you had served time. You yeah. did uh, just a little bit of time, which any time that you serve is time. Yeah. You know, tell me how much time, or tell all of us how much time you did serve. A little a bit, uh, almost a year, almost a year. And you were, where were you at? That I had the Rose region. You know, I've heard a lot of good things about that place. Are they true? Uh, <laughs> no, nah, not really. <laughs> no, I ain't gonna lie. No, they, they weren't. <laughs> but they do have, uh, I guess they have a, a, a medical. Yeah, I was in a medical pod where everybody that's in the pod have medical issues and it's a nurse on standby, she got her little desk, her little medical supplies, and um, if anything was to go wrong, like you needed to be... Seen immediately? Yeah, they would come. It might take a little while, but they would come. And luckily, I was one of the ones that didn't need anything. You know, I was in there, like I said, with open bed sores, because before I got incarcerated, I was supposed to have surgery, but you know, things happened, I got incarcerated. So I was in there with those. Couldn't be in population like that. But when I first got there, they did put me in population for about two weeks, and then I made a fuss about it. And then they were like, okay, we're gonna move you, but we gotta make sure they got a bed open because you know they had a new inmate coming in, and he supposed to be coming in your place in population. So when they moved me back there, I already had been in the medical part, that was my second time getting locked up. So I already knew the ins and outs and how to adapt and things of that nature. So I just adapted, you know. You know, you had shared with me uh, what you, served this time for right. and this was one of the craziest things that I ever heard but you know will you talk a little bit about what you got locked up for what the charge was yeah I got locked up for assault on a law enforcement officer that particular day in my old neighborhood downtown I was mad at my business you know with my lady friend and other people in the neighborhood you know how it is you know when you in the hood you know there's a lot of people around something happened that it didn't have nothing to do with me and the officer decided to pick on me once the person he was talking to, like, go talk to the guy in the wheelchair. And I'm like trying to push away with my lady friend. And she's like, no, 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 sit right here, cause you ain't bothering nobody. And he started messing with me about a alcohol beverage. Then it went from there to, I guess I blacked out and I assaulted the man and then backup came and they put me in the car and I asked if they call my sister, my mama, cause I stay around the corner. They said no at first, F that. You going to jail, I'm pressing charges, and the other officer's like, let me talk to him, and if I can talk to him, we'll just give you a court date, but you ain't gonna go to jail today. He didn't wanna do that. And they said he was a rookie, so he act like I beat him up, beat him up. He didn't have no scars, no abrasions, and everybody was like, why he didn't pull his taser, he's gonna do anything to you. We got cops killing young men, but he's saying you hit him. I'm like, well, I don't know. And I kept asking to see the video, and I was locked up. Never seen the video, but my court appointed lawyer, quote unquote, was like, yeah, you really did a number on him. I'm like, okay, can I see it? They didn't let me see it. And the judge was like, well, this is six months mandatory, but I've seen your face so many times, I'm gonna get a little longer than that. So they gave you a year. Yeah. You know, 
you brought up a really interesting point, and I, I want to address this. You know, you are fortunate that the dude didn't shoot you and kill you. Right, I am. Yes. Uh, it's just crazy to me to think that you know, here you are. You're a handicapped dude. You're in. You're in a wheelchair, and this cop's gonna give you an assault. Right. He could have easily let me go on my way, but he wanted. To, hey, I see a beer. Uh, you're not even dispatched out here because of me. The beer ain't got nothing to do with me. You trying to find a way to lock me up? You supposed to be taking care of what you got called out here for. That don't have nothing to do with the guy in the wheelchair. And I think it was, from what I heard, I was a little intoxicated at the time, but I was minding my business. I heard that he grabbed me and I almost fell. So that's what led it to you grabbing him and punching him up. Oh, you did? Yeah. They said I hit him numerous times in the face. That's crazy. Him being a rookie, he just fell. My wheelchair went back. They said I tried to roll off and go home. And then that's when backup came. And as I'm strolling, I almost made it home. They caught me. Like, hey, turn around. Nah. No. And then I look, I see him getting off the ground. I'm like, well, I know I've been sipping a little bit. They're like, well, we don't know what's going on. We just heard something happen, and we see him get off the ground. You rolling off, fussing and screaming. And I'm like, oh, okay. They're like, well, we going to see what we can do. But we don't want you to sit in jail. And I mentioned that I had bed sores, and I have a nurse supposed to come the next day and treat it. And they're like, nah, he don't want to do that. He wants you to go to jail. And then he was getting irate, fussing and cussing and put him in the car, take him. Matter of fact, I'm gonna take him. He took me himself and the whole time I'm in the car. He didn't call me out my name, but he was verbally assaulting me. And I mentioned that to the lawyer, but uh, they, the judge didn't care about that. You know, I get a lot of people who ask me, and I've served time in prison with dudes who are in wheelchairs. Right. And I've talked about what it's like for guys in wheelchairs to serve time, but I personally don't know because, you know, how could I know? Right. I only know what I see, but for you, I really want to talk about what it was like to serve time being in a wheelchair. To be honest, it was depressing. It was, I wouldn't say hard, but it was, you know, you got to know how to adapt in it, you know. There's certain things you can and can't do, you know, and you got people telling you what you can and can't do. And then me being in a wheelchair, it's like, for instance, taking a shower, you know, that was kind of annoying because you ain't got the amenities that you have in your regular house home. When you were in general population, did they have a, a handicap stall? No, they had a regular one, but I would have to take a regular like sitting chair and transfer from the wheelchair to the sitting chair to have an inmate, you know, push my wheelchair close enough to when I finish shower and I can hop in it. They wouldn't have to have nobody help me, you know, because they ain't allowed it in there. They, well, you, you got to do it yourself, you know, so I just, found a way to just do it myself and just be in there and stay to myself, you know, get my little canteen. I would socialize with people in there. Other than that, you know, I was cool. Ain't nobody really bothered me. They had some hard heads in there, but I ain't paying no mind to it. I'm here to do my time and get out. Do you think that you were treated any differently because of, of your handicap, like either by staff or by maybe even certain inmates? Do you feel like people took advantage of you, tried to take advantage of you? You always hear about, uh, you know, getting locked up and you're gonna get somebody's gonna try you. right 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 did you ever have any kind of altercations uh I, I actually did have an altercation with a guy he was uh locked down because you know they put you in the red suits when you lock down and he had some type of i'm gonna say on camera some type of sickness so he couldn't interact with us you know and when he uh got in there you know i would talk to him from his top tier as well as everybody else then it came a time where he said something to the nurse while he was locked down and then he wanted me to take the fall for it and I didn't. So then when they let him out of lockdown, you know, it was a back and forth thing of what him and another guy that got a murder charge was gonna do if they let the guy with the murder charge out to me. I guess they had some type of weapons in there, they was gonna assault me. And I ain't really think about it and worry about it. And the old heads were like, you need to tell staff, you know, cause he got some type of quote unquote disease and if he touch you y'all fight and he bleed on you you can get it and he mad at you because I'm like I ain't I'm about to leave I'm about to go home I ain't worrying about talking they said stop looking at it as snitching just let the people know so what I did was I told I wrote a letter told the staff you know I don't feel right for my safety I'm about to go home at that time I was about to get released in like three four weeks can you lock me down and they, they like lock you down for the whole three four weeks why what's going on never mentioned what was going on and they was like, well, who did what? And then you got the inmates, when they when they finally locked me down, they're like, okay, we'll lock you down. You ain't did nothing, but when you want to come out, let us know. Then you got the inmates, it's cool with him coming to my cell, like, hey, you better not snitch, you better not say nothing. You know, I'm like, I ain't gonna say nothing. You know, I'm, I'm doing this, but I won't put my hands on you. Because believe it or not, people in wheelchairs do have everybody's strength, they can't hurt you. 
But y'all talking about what y'all got in that cell. I don't got nothing, so I'm not gonna tell no no officer or nothing like that. I'm gonna let them figure it out. Basically, end up happening was I guess another old head. You know how the old heads are. End up talking to the sergeant because they said the dude that I had an altercation with was being a nuisance to everybody. So this particular guy went and I guess you call it snitched and was like he messing with the dude in the wheelchair. This is why he locked himself down. They took and removed that guy out. And then when I got released, that guy was asking people that I gave my phone number to that I was cool with, where's Jamal at, you know? I'm like, I'm out now, <laughs> he don't want no problems now. And when he got out, I seen his Facebook, but I never hit him up like, what's up, you know, we ain't cool. And I told myself, cause he said some foul things about what he would do to my mother and my sister if he ever met them, some derogatory, disrespectful things. So I said, if I ever see him, I hope the police understand. Cause I ain't gonna dap him up and be like, oh, forget what you said. And I told my mama what he said. She said, if you see him, I hope I pray for him. Cause he, he was disrespectful. And after that, when he left, they let me out, and I ain't had no issues with nobody else after that. Cause they moved him to another, like upstairs somewhere. You know, when I was locked up with, uh, there were two guys in the cell block with me who were in wheel, or two guys in the housing unit with me who were in wheelchairs. And yeah, I've definitely seen. Uh, these dudes have some issues, get right. to fighting. Yeah. I've seen one dude get beat up uh, who was in the wheelchair, real slick talking dude. And, you know, I felt bad for the, for the guy who, who got beat up. But at the same time, uh, you don't get no points for that in my, right. uh, in my right. book. You like, don't. you don't get no points for messing with somebody who's handicapped, whether they can fight or not. Right. So that was just really crazy being reminded of that. Yeah. When you left from the general population and you went to the medical uh, pod, right. you're in there with probably all sorts of people, yeah. far beyond a physical disability. I'm sure you were locked up with some pretty crazy individuals. As yeah, well. I was locked up with uh, guys who had mental issues, guys who didn't want to take their medication, guys who would throw feces, guys who would, you know, entertain themselves in the window when they see a female steal, so to speak. Yeah, Just a lot of crazy things and you had the ones who were waiting to get shipped off to prison that had medical issues such as cancer. They had one dude in there that was supposed to have AIDS, but he didn't touch nobody, you know. He would try to interact, but I'm like, mm. you, by touching him like that, you can't get it. Yeah. It gotta be through saliva or something like that. But I mean, everybody in there was pretty cool after I had that one incident, you know. Everybody else that was there was on my side, so they were pretty cool, you know. They looked out for me. If I was waiting for my canteen to come and I needed something, they give me something and they won't tick for tat. Oh, I gave you this when you get it back. I would just give it back. Like, here you go. And a couple of times they would take it and be like, no, you okay? I like your vibe. And it was a couple of times, you know, a couple of guys that were older told me I got a slick mouth. I'm going to end up getting effed up in there. But I'm like, what I supposed to do? Be a punk in here? You know what I mean? Like, I'm mad at my business, but you got others trying me. So I ain't going to just be quiet. And I'm not going to go talk to no sergeant and be like, hey, they bothering me. I'm going to speak my mind. And a couple of old heads that mentioned that to me, they didn't like that, so they, they stopped talking to me, but they would speak, but as far as like interacting, playing cards, they didn't do that with me no more, because they said, I guess they felt like they was gonna end up putting their hands on me, but I ain't had no issues with them, they just seen how it was with other people, like, I guess they figured I was a bully, so to speak, but I'm like, no, this is how I'm on the streets, you know, you can't be soft in the wheelchair, they didn't understand that, because they don't got family members or friends that's handicapped in the wheelchair that's paralyzed, so they just took it as, oh, he just slick at the mouth. I got 10 years, I'm about to, you know, then I kept hollering about I'm about to leave, and I heard that you ain't supposed to say that when people got 10, 20 years, they don't want to hear that, so a couple people mentioned that to me, stop effing saying that, you know what I mean, I'm getting irritated with you saying that, but they say it from a distance, they didn't say it in my face, and I ain't, I ain't getting mad or nothing like that, I just stopped talking to them type people, like, well, I mean, I'm leaving, I don't know what you did to be in here, you know, some people deserve to be in there, some people don't, I ain't asked nobody what they was in here for, they told me, they told me, you know, I told people what I was in here for, and they was like, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't be here. You should be at home with your family. But when I mentioned I'm about to leave, they like, oh, stop. No, I'm about to go to prison. I don't want to hear that. Yeah, I've talked about that. And I, and I know that personally, but right. you know, to each their own. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, if you find yourself in the situation that you find yourself in, yeah, uh, it, it, it is what it is. Exactly, man. I want to ask you, uh, I've never served time in the medical pod. Right. But I can only imagine that it's got to be it's gotta be crazy. Yeah, it's um they do they do medical uh medication passes through the, the little tray slot where you get your after and during breakfast time. So in the morning everybody lines up, get their breakfast tray, and then after you eat, the nurse will come, call you by name, you get your medication. And you had 
people in there that didn't take it. Like, if you don't take your medicine, they're not gonna harass you about it. They just note that he didn't take it, and they noted as they noted as being in a. I forgot what the name of it is, but the song, yeah, refused refused to take medication, but. They had me on medicine, and I'm like, oh, I ain't take this on the outside. I'm like, what is this for? They're like, oh, the doctor. I'm like, is that even a real doctor? Like, I know what I take. Like, I got a paper in my tote of what I'm supposed to take. Blood pressure medicine, and they were trying to give me some other medicine that make you like a zombie. I'm like, what? Play some Thorazine. Yeah, like, like I'm like, I ain't taking that. They're like, refusal. Then a couple times I refused. The sergeant came in, why ain't you taking your medicine? Like, am I supposed to take this? This my paper. This is what I was taking on the outside. He's like, oh. Cause they were doing a lot of foul stuff in there, so I ain't. I've heard, I've heard quite a bit about it. We don't got to go no further in there. It's uh, no further into that because right. you know that place is on the news all the time. Yeah, I'm glad I ain't in there no more, man. I mean, really, they ain't, they definitely ain't getting no better in there. It's been two and a half years, and I've been out of trouble, so I'll keep it that way. You're what, 31 years old? 31. I'll be 32 October the 20th. So. Have you gotten in a lot of trouble throughout your life, or because I know you said that this was your second time, or that the judge said that you know he was tired of seeing your face? Yeah, I have gotten in trouble for like little stuff like fade to appear, drunk in public, um, and a couple of times, like I said, I missed court, so I had a cake years out, and a, couple, a few times I turned myself in, and they just a few times they let me out on my own recognizance. And that first time it was for a failure to appear and I did four and a half months. And like a month of that, I was in Newport News Jail and then they shipped me to the region. Then I did the remainder of my time and I went in front of the judge. She's like, oh, this is BS, time served. And then I tried to stay out of trouble then that assault happened, you know, a few years later and then I did that whole year. But it's been two and a half years now right? since you've had any trouble. Yeah, I went through probation, finished the probation met with her and then I was supposed to keep meeting up with her but that's when I found out I had bed so surgery to get them surgically closed so as I was in the hospital I kept in contact with her and she was like you don't even gotta call me no more ain't nobody gonna arrest you or none of that I'm gonna let the courts know you had bed so surgery you don't gotta send no pictures or nothing just send the paperwork from the doctor to me to my facts and I, I give it to the judge and then the judge was like okay you know he's still gonna stay on probation but he don't gotta call in so once his probation up she'll let me know and so, I kept I kept calling her, you know, even though I had to, you know, and letting her know how I was doing surgery because I was in the hospital five and a half months. Five only, and a half months. It was only supposed to be one month, but it turned into complications, and I could have died from what they say if they had to just let me leave. Because every time I about to leave, he had check it, and it was an access somewhere. I'm like, okay, and he like emergency surgery. I'm like, ah, oh. and I started crying, getting depressed, lashing out. Then I had a falling out with the doctor, and I'm like, well. I'm supposed to be free, you know, just feel like I'm in jail, you know, once again, I'm looking at a window, I can't, I'm bedridden, I'm like, I'm on bedridden before I got in here, he's like, well, this is how we do the surgery, because I was in a sand bed, like, it's a bed with sand, and you just gotta lay there, I ain't turned into a vegetable, you know, I was lifting up, got my arms right, and you know, I, I wear the pins anyway, that's something I want to mention to the guys, I've been wearing the pins for 31 years, so, as I was in there, the nurse would try to change me. I'm like, no, nah, I can do it myself. But if I had a few accidents, and they had to do that, and they looked like they was irritated, huffing and puffing. Well, you need to stop drinking the coffee, yeah. You know, does it, uh, is it, I, I don't want to ask the wrong question here. And I, I, you can ask, man, go ahead. Is it at all degrading for you when people have to help you in any kind of a way, like what you just mentioned about the depends? If somebody has to help you with that, or uh, in jail with the shower situation, for example? Not, not, not really. I used to look at it like that when I was locked up, like, oh, they helping me, I don't like this. But then as I thought about it, like, everybody need help someday. At some point in time, you're going to need help. So, no, I ain't, I don't really... And as of now, I don't have nobody to help me. Like my new doctor tried to give me a nurse. Like, why well, need a nurse? I just need you to send these paperwork to my insurance to get what I need. I don't need a nurse, but the nurse ended up coming. She's like, you got good upper body strength. You don't need a nurse, but I can do physical therapy. So I'm about to start that. Then that's how the new wheelchair thing came apart, came upon. And the guy that owns the company came and was like, you know, we can help you with that. I'm like, well, I need that. Cause this is not where it's at. Man, it's I'm raggedy. And I had this for like five years. He ain't got an arm wrestle. I was locked up with this wheelchair. The arm rest fell off in jail. They tried to screw it back on, but as they got annoyed, I just threw it away. Where do you get the wheelchair from? The insurance paid for. My old insurance, I had Optima. 
and they paid for it. Now I got a new company called Mangellan Complete Care. So they're gonna pay for a whole custom wheelchair, it's about $2,300. It ain't nothing like this. Custom wheels, like racing wheels, they got a detachable electrical motor. So it's a detachable motor, you can charge it up. It go about like 10 miles per hour, you just hit a button, and it go left or right without you even turning your wheelchair. You can just hit the switch and it'll go left or right. So that'll be built and delivered here in about 60 to 90 days. He gotta meet with me one more time with his laptop, go over my coloring, my design, and how I want my cushion to look, because I'm getting a new cushion too, that's about $600. So you add that up, that's about $3,000 and change. So I'm sure I'm gonna pay for all that. You know, we we did something a couple of years ago, like two years ago, we sent a woman $500 for a wheelchair. But wow. from what you're talking about, you know, twenty three hundred dollars. Yeah, I had to make sure insurance was gonna pay for it. I said, Y'all gonna pay for it? I ain't got no money. I had to set up a GoFundMe or something. He said, No, nah, insurance was paying for it. And I called my caseworker. She said, Yes. Anything you need, depends, new wheelchair, because the wheelchair you got, we didn't buy it. Your old insurance company bought that. You with us, you've been with us for a few months now, so whatever amenities you need, we're gonna pay for it. So I'm just waiting on that wheelchair. I wish I had a picture to show you, but if I find one, I definitely text it to you. You're like, oh, this is cool. Look like some Hot Wheels type stuff. There you go. I already told him I wanted red. I want red or blue with some type of like graphic engraving in it. I told him I'm gonna sketch it out so when he come, he can incorporate that in his laptop drawing. So it's gonna be cool. You know, I want to talk about the depression. Okay. What is what is the depression like for you? Is this something that comes and goes? Is this something that you deal with on a daily basis? I deal with it on a daily basis. Like, I be having thoughts, but then again, I, like I said, I just think positive. You know, I got people I know that took their own life and their significant other's life through depression. And then some of them ain't even having significant other. It was just depression. You know, they had drank their life away. And, you know, I think like that, but recently now, I just watch some on YouTube, talk to some friends. You know, every once in a while, like I said, I might drink a beer. That'll make me happy. You know, some people look at it like, oh, alcohol, oh, you might get drunk. I don't get drunk. One beer, I don't get drunk. You got to drink numerous beers, and I used to be a slam alcoholic, so when I talk to my mom, I'd be like, I'm drinking a beer. The old me, she would have been like, what the heck? Now when I say it, she's like, okay, you ain't thinking about doing nothing crazy. Because some people think when you drink alcohol, it'll make you want to harm yourself. It'll, all right, it's the opposite. I get happy when I drink a beer, put my music on, I be singing. I might call a female, you know, video chat, be singing to her. I don't drink and then be like, oh, I want to do this to myself. Or I'll trash the room. I don't do none of that. Or sometimes I don't even drink beer. I just drink coffee, to be honest with you. That's how I deal with it because that medicine, if I take that medicine right now, I'm not going to be able to sleep. It'll help with the depression. It's also, it's a depression and nerve pill. That's what you prescribe for. You're a dude with a lot of energy, a dude with a, a really positive vibe as well. Right. And I want to... I don't know. I want to get some. I want to get some words from you to the audience because as we're getting to know you, so are they. But you know, if you could leave somebody, or if you could let people know about who you are, the stuff that you've been through, and also what keeps you going. You know, how would you best word that to someone? I would say, me. I'm Jamal, a person who has been through a lot. Still going through a lot, still trying to conquer and overcome my obstacles, and just you know be a good guy and try to help others. You know, I would say because you know being depressed and being handicapped and paralyzed is not easy for anybody. Some people might think, oh, all you do is get up and walk. I had people say that to me, and they are not even a doctor. Like, well, I, I remember when you, where that's when I used to walk. I no longer can walk. You know, this is not something I'm just doing. Like, nobody just want to sit in a wheelchair. So I would say to somebody, you know, going through something as far as I'm going through or something similar, just pray. All you gotta do is pray and, you know, thank God that, you know, you're alive. That's how I look at it, you know, because it could be, it could be worse. You know, you could be to a point where you can't do anything. They, how they say a vegetable state, you know, you can't move. You gotta have people turn you. I'm one of the ones that's grateful to, you know, move around and I can shower, I can clean my room, I can push my wheelchair, I can do laundry. So. I'm blessed, you know, that's all I can say. And I just stay prayed up, you know. Keep Pray positive, up. keep positive people around me. I'm glad I met you. I'm glad I met Cody. Shouts out to Dave, shouts out to Rabbit. <laughs> and shouts out to uh what's his name? Danny. <laughs> Danny, shouts out to you and shouts out to the after prison show, man. It's a blessing, man. And everybody, like I said, if you're going through something in your life, just smile. Kodak moment, just smile. You don't candy camera, hey.
Look, let me ask you this as well. One last question real quick. All right. You mentioned that uh, you stay positive thinking about the future. Right. You know, what are your goals and some of your hopes and things that you would like to see for yourself in the future? My goals and my hope is that I can walk again one day. So hopefully, you know, doing physical therapy, getting this new leg mobilizer and working with the therapist, you know, maybe that can be a possibility, like she said. So um, I'm going to work on that, try to stay positive and, you know, blessings might come upon me. That's all I can say. Jamal, look, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I wanted to just get a chance to come meet you for this first time and see how this went and right. think about the potential of what we could do with you moving forward. I definitely would like to do some more stuff with you. Likewise. I wanted to do something for you. Okay. And I didn't know honestly what, what to do. Okay. There was a number of things that had crossed my mind. I, I talked with Cody about this this morning mm -hmm. and, you know, the best thing that I figured I could do right now for you is... You're a, you're a guy who's living pretty much week to week in this hotel room. Mm -hmm. You don't have any money to be able to do anything for yourself. Your right. family helps you in whatever way that they can. Right. So I want to just bless you with a little bit of money right now. Wow. Something, it's not a whole heck of a lot. It's only $200. I want to give this to you, though, and just, this is for you. This isn't just from me. This is from the entire After Prison show who sees a positive individual such as yourself, who doesn't get a chance to leave from this hotel room that you live in all that often because you don't have the money to be able to do so. Wow. So I hope that this money will allow you to get out here and to be able to enjoy this day. Yeah. Man. Get on a bus, go meet with one of your lady friends, go get you something to eat. Yeah. I want to say to you and Cody and everybody else, I gratefully appreciate that, man. Like, I've been going through hell and back if I can say that you know what I mean I got my aunt you know she don't mind helping but you know we've been looking at places so I won't be in the situation and for you to do that that's very gracious to you my brother well, look I want to give this to you Jamal wow man that is this is for you right here that's from the entire after prison show thanks that's for man. you rocking with us and I'm gonna continue to rock with you guys man after prison show is, is, is lit, man. That's all I can say. And look out for Jamal in future videos, too. And look out for Jamal on his future YouTube video. Me and him gonna work on that. Me and Joe gonna work on that because I need his help. So, along with Cody, we're gonna figure this thing out. And this right here is a blessing. I, I'm gonna get out and enjoy myself. Probably won't be today, probably be tomorrow, but I'm gonna go out and treat myself because it's been a long time since I was able to do that. So, you know, yeah. tell me a little bit about what you're gonna be able to do with that. I probably go out to eat. I probably. Uh, get a haircut. Um, probably buy me a couple pairs of sweats from Walmart. Things of that nature. Hygiene products. I need some more of those. So, this a workout, man. And I gratefully appreciate you, man. It's good that I met you in person. If I go to my phone right now, after the prison show is up there, I'm subscribed. And I ain't just subscribed. I've been subscribed since day one. And all of you guys are very excellent, man. Very, very excellent guys, man. Jamal, again, man, absolute pleasure getting a chance to meet you. And Likewise, looking, brother. And looking forward to seeing what we can do with you moving forward. Thank you. I appreciate you, boss. Well, at least we're getting you out now. <laughs> Damn, Jamal. How much a camera like that cost? You get them used? Six. Yeah, brand new, it's like five or six hundred bucks. Oh, I ain't but you don't need nothing like that, man. I can use a phone, right? You can use a phone. A lot of people use a phone. Six dollars.